Just by way of highlight, it took the church a while to figure out what that was going to look like. And so while most of the time this year we're going to find ourselves in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but this morning we, uh, we catapult ahead a bit and look at Paul in Philippians 2 because he begins to bring out this sense of who Jesus is uh, some 30, 40 years after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so the church has had some time to think about this. And what, I'm, what we're going to study this morning is actually one of the first hymns of the church. And so if you're looking in your Bibles at chapter 2 of Philippians, and starting in verse 5, you begin to see that in most modern Bibles, this is actually put in verse. So it looks like a poem, or it looks like a song. And uh, that's a, that's a, you know, obviously if this was in the biblical Greek, you wouldn't see any of that. But the punctuation is there to give emphasis to the fact that this is something that, uh, that God is doing. So speculative question for you. If you were trying to get the message of God to people who had no idea who God was, how would you reveal God to them? What's your best plan? How would we somehow get to folks who don't know this idea and help them to understand the idea? What would have to happen in order for them to get God from you? Okay. God's answer was easy. We know what that is. It's, the, it's, it's where we're going to take this this morning that is, is, is likely to be new or at least challenging to our hearts. Because God used Jesus. God's key person was Jesus Christ. Now the reason that's important is because of the first, book, the first verse as, as we're studying. We'll just take this verse by verse, line by line. Verse 5 of Philippians says, your attitude should be, and that's the people of Philippi, and now us as we read it. The word is saying to us, your attitude, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Jesus wants us to be like him. God wants us to be like him. It is very, this is a very subtle but important point. To merely know or embrace the idea that Jesus has become God is not enough. That won't work. It's theologically correct. It is biblically orthodox. At about 300 AD, they gave up trying to explain it, and they just, they just said, in, in simple, this is the way it works. Jesus is never less than God while being never more than man. Go for it. Figure it out. It's the application of that that is important to us this morning. We can know that. We can assent to that. We can say we believe that. You could pass a test on that. As Jesus became man and walked the earth, we are called to fulfill our spiritual destiny by becoming Jesus. To live like Jesus. To be like Him. If not, if it just happens in the life of Jesus and doesn't happen in the majority life of the church, the message stops there. The ball drops, the baton falls, the race is over. The myth, now hear this, the myth that someone sitting next to me will run the race instead of me. Someone else will be the leader or take the gospel or own all of this business while I kind of just, I, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this later on, while I just kind of date Jesus. I just kind of date the church. Is a misnomer that is running the church of Jesus Christ 
in affluent and influential, self-controlled places of the world like America and parts of Western Europe into ruin and peril. In the rest of the world, where they are over their ears in projects that they have no way of sustaining or making happen, except, oh Jesus, you do this in my life if you want it done. God is coming out in full power and the world is changing. Only where we have an optional Jesus, I believe those things. I'm not so sure I want to live those things yet. And there, there may yet be people that will live them for me at Good Sam or in some other church. It, it, it is the place that we're at. And so we are looking this morning. You sang it. The worship band might have brought it, but you sang it. We will make him known. Really? Do we mean that? Are we going to do that? So verse 6, uh, five, the end of 5 and into, into 6 brings us to the first of three realities that we're going to look at. Not simply as theology or Bible study this morning. What's happening in your life is the question. Jesus is God who from the very beginning... Who, or who, beginning in very nature, God. Jesus, that's who he is. And this is by design. See, we sometimes read Genesis and we see that they get further and further and further away from God. And God finally says, oh, wow, I just, I'm going to have to go down there and straighten it out. That's not how the Bible works. From the very beginning, in, 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 in a number of places in the Bible, it says that Jesus was slain at the foundation of the earth. Before Adam and Eve. Before there was a snake. Before there was a temptation. Before there was a fall from grace. This had been done. This is the design. Check this out. This is, uh, this is John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And it doesn't say who the Word is until verse 14. And the Word became flesh from the beginning. How about this? Colossians. He, meaning Jesus, Colossians 1.15, is the image of the invisible God. Jesus appears in flesh for two purposes. To fulfill what was left of the Old Testament. And that was to make sure that every person walking on the face of the earth knew God's standard and knew that they couldn't keep it. A lot of people still today believe that somehow if they could keep the, good, the Ten Commandments, if they could be a good person, if they could fulfill some of that, then that should give them some credit. And the whole Old Testament was God facing the world and, and giving them huge blessings, a, a, a chosen nation, a, 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 the law, the land, all of that, so that they would fall short and say at some point, we need some help here. And then the Messiah came. Jesus finishes that by making sure that when Jesus walked on the face of the earth, he did fulfill the Ten Commandments. And we were kind of going, how does he do that? And how come I can't do that? But Jesus takes it a step further because he reminds us that God is not angry because we are sinners. God has compassion for us. God would no more be angry at a sinner than a lifeguard would stand over a pool uh, where there's a kid drowning that's been giving him trouble all day and say, yeah, he deserves that. But that is the prevailing image of God in many of our churches. But this is what God is up to. Punishment. And, and, and Jesus took it further than that. He says, you can't please God either. You can't earn this stuff from God. You can't go anywhere. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this incredible message and I want you to trust God. That His life in your life is enough. And that's what it's all about. Because the minute we start believing that Jesus actually saved us from something, and we start walking in that life, something begins to happen. And it is usually something like this. God comes to us and asks us to do something that is way beyond our pay grade. And we say, I can't do that. And God goes, great. 
That's exactly where I, because when you pull that off, and you know you can't, and so does your family, and so do your friends, and so does everyone at work, because they know you're a mess up, and it happens, they'll go, how'd you do that? God. That's the game plan. We're, we've wasted so much time trying to act like we're something we're not so that we don't embarrass our friends at church and, and, and God when we go into the marketplace. And God says, knock that stuff off. I want real people who trust me. And Jesus is doing this all by virtue of God's design and then by obedience. Look at this. Talking about Jesus. Did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Jesus didn't demand his Godship and his, 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 his man in God status. He didn't earn it. He didn't cajole for it. He didn't beg for it. He obeyed. He paid the price. You want to know whether you're obeying something or not? It's going to cost you, and you're not going to want to do it. That's when you know you're at the edge of obeying something. Whether it's your parents or your boss or whatever. That's, and that's so difficult, and that's why true obedience in the church is so neglected. Because we think it's optional. Jesus obeyed by washing feet, kissing his betrayer, being silent at his trial, praying in the garden till sweat came off of his face like blood, dying on the cross, rising again so that three days later he could reconcile with his best early friend, or his best earthly friends who had three days ago chickened down on him. I mean, he could have rose from the grave and said, back off, I'm looking for 12 new guys. <laughs> and we often think of that. How often have I heard Christians say, oh, God can't use me. Uh, yeah, that's right. God can use you if you trust Him, if you open your heart. Jesus is God. Jesus is also man. Look at verse 7. But He made Himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Did I say Jesus washed feet? Okay, I just want to give you an illustration. I want to talk to you about the, 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 the version of what washing feet is all about. I, want, I don't want you to overthink this because it'll be a real bad trip if you do. Just, just don't overthink this. Okay? So Jesus washes feet on the night when he was betrayed. I asked Crystal if she'd let me wash her feet. She said no. So. <laughs> this is what the Bible says. The Bible says that Jesus took off all of his clothes. Don't overthink this, please. <laughs> and then he took a towel. Wrapped it around. Now in the Bible times, when you wash someone's feet, you know, you wash someone's feet of the same sex, okay? Because that was just kind of right to do. You ever had your foot washed, by the way? Oh, yeah. Someone? Did you, how was eye contact when someone was washing their feet? Kind of tough. Kind of, kind of tough. I, in fact, I don't know if in foot washing, whether uh, uh, it's, it's like uh, more humbling to have your feet washed or to, or to wash someone's feet. <laughs> Almost a, a, a malfunction of my wardrobe. <laughs> so here's, don't overthink this. Kind of don't, don't overthink this. So here's Jesus. He walks into the room. He's prepared. And this is... This is, this is what he does. He gets down and he washes feet, okay? And you're all that experience if you've ever done that. This is what's never happened in church, but it happened in the upper room. This is what Jesus did next. And he dried their feet. Now we're really talking about eye contact problems. <laughs> because he is serving like no one would have ever served. If you were God, or you were the boss, or you were the leader of the program, 
This is what Jesus does. He's fully God, and he's fully man. And he's giving himself in this, in this very, very powerful way. By his behavior, he's a servant. And then by his physicality, he is made in human likeness. Our flesh, our bone, our blood, our mind, our hearts, our souls. In fact, when Jesus walked the face of the earth, he, all of his miracles were limited to what he asked the Father for and whether the Father would work through him. He didn't do that out of his power. He, he, he vanquished that power. He gave it away. And so sometimes it says, Jesus did very few miracles. You see, I would like, in my theology, to think of Jesus as a kind of a DC Marvel Comics kind of person. Right? Because then at least he would be wearing tights when he washed my feet. Okay? And, and we would have an explanation for his powers and how he got them. You see? We, we like that because then we can explain it. This is totally and completely unexplainable. This matched only by the cross of dying for us. And then forgiving the people in pretty short order who just crushed his hands and wrists with a heavy mallet. Made sure he wasn't going anywhere with a huge spike. This is Jesus being man for us. This is Jesus in his full physicality. And, and the writer of Hebrews goes on in chapter 2, verse 11, and chapter 5, verse 6, to say two more powerful things. In every way, in every way, you can't overthink that one. Jesus was tempted with what you're tempted with. No. Yeah. In every way. And he learned... God learned from what he suffered. And, and you know, you kind of press your mind a little bit. So what did he learn from what he suffered? He learned how to sit in your chair with your disabilities and your mindset. He came here so there would be no doubt that he knows where you're at right now. He knows it. He carries it. He lived it. He said, I didn't phone it in. I didn't do this from the clouds and not get too close to it. I'm the one that kissed uh, betrayers and touched lepers and did all that stuff. So you, you would know that you're not untouchable and that your problems aren't beyond me. I shared them. I was with you. And then finally, uh, the, the last part of this is very, very revealing. Uh, Jesus is God and man. And I'll just give you the two fill in the blanks here that by hardship and by blessing. Verse 8 says, And being found as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to even death on the cross. So I got kind of excited about the word. I'm always looking for the word that's in the word. And the, the word here is humble. What does humility mean? Humility means we know what we are capable of, our good qualities, and we know our limits intimately. We know this is, this is what I can do and this is what I can't do. You've got to know that. You've got to be intimate with that. You actually have to be okay with that because the next part of the definition of humility is this accepts one's weakness, this side, as an opportunity to grow, not a condition to be defended. How many times have you been caught looking weak and you had ten excuses as to why you were living that way? And God just says, knock it off. Those are your weaknesses. I'm okay with that. That's where I am. Those weaknesses are, are the cloud, and I'm going to be the sun that breaks through that. But if you keep defending, and if you keep having an excuse for everything you do, there can be no humility. It's still about you and your ego. You're still constructing a world in which everyone sees you according to what you're trying to project. But no one does. We're polite here. We don't tell you that. But you see, we eliminate all that when our weaknesses our, and, and our capabilities are well known and our weaknesses are a word of sharing. In recovery, we say you're as sick as your secrets. 
when you have no secrets, then instead of defending them, you can say, oh, there I go again. Thanks, my brother. Didn't really need that right now, but you know, I guess I did need that. Let's move on. And then this thing about exaltation. Listen to this. Therefore God exalted. And just, just check this out. And then lay it against what you think it says. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place. And gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. On heaven and on earth. And under the earth. That's interesting there. And, and, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God. You know what's going on here? Jesus is never exalted on earth. He's only exalted in heaven. How many times have you found yourself doing something or, you know, so when's the exaltation come? You know, I've got all these pins. I've been going to Sunday school since I was, you know, three years old. I drag them to church with me as they hang off my shirt. I've done all these things. When, when does that happen? The scriptures tell us plainly that if God who came in the form of man was not exalted, did not get his ticket punched down here. But it only happened up there. That gives us a lot more patience to think, hey, I think I better do a little more of my ego work. Because if I'm to reveal Jesus, if I'm to make him known, but my ego's too far ahead of the thing, you know, they'll never see you if your ego, which is this little yappy dog that you walk every day and bark and keeping everybody away. You know? No one's gonna see Jesus, they just see the yappy dog. And could give you a wide berth. That's our ego. That's what we're still defending. I, uh, uh, when I was in Visalia as a pastor, I, I, I met a, a really wonderful pastor. We, him and the guy with the Presbyterian Church. Imagine that, the Frozen Chosen. And uh, the three of us got together and kind of lived a, a, a little bit of community amongst pastors. He went on to be one of the uh, ghost writers for the book The Shack. Remember the book The Shack? Uh, sold billions, you know. They all made buku money. And so, um, I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but you know, you think about a Christian who's made it, who is exalted? I just challenge you. If you're if you're thinking, man, well they made it, so maybe I can make it. Just go talk to those people. I was in the midst of you know trying to get my own little scratchy book together, so I took it to to Wayne, and we were working with it a little bit. And I said, so how? What's it like being on top of the world with Christian success? He goes, do you want the story? We'll have lunch after this, and I'll tell you the story. Yeah, we're all millionaires. But you cannot believe the cross that is being carried. You cannot believe it. And, and he listed at least six huge opportunities that that book is never going to have because of ego. It breaks his heart. You see, no one makes it here. No one's made it here. You think someone's made it? You say, well, it's easy for them. They walk with them. <laughs> Talk to them. Jesus said, pick up my cross. He didn't say, pick up your prize as you go out the door. This isn't the Ellen show. <laughs> right? It comes out that the soil that brings forth the richest fruit is full of what? Yeah, well, we will skip that. Decay, death, bacteria. The substance that we call humus. Interesting. English root word for human or humble. We're all made out of humus. God knows it. He's waiting for us to figure it out. So he could do some fertilizing with our lives. But we think that we're something bigger than that. Can't use us. Reminds me of a story about two guys. They, uh, they, they lived on Sycamore Court. Unfortunately, they lived two houses down and, uh, and across the street from each other on Sycamore Court. The guy that was delivering manure that day was supposed to go to Sycamore Road, but he went to Sycamore Court. And he delivered the manure, just backed up to their driveway, and boom, 
dumped it. Literally dumped it in both of their driveways and drove up. Two completely different reactions. One guy walked out of his house and said, what? I didn't order this. Who, who put, and, 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 and I'm not going to touch it. Manure, it's going to sit there. And he wrote letters to the editor, the Better Business Bureau. He was going to sue everybody. He got really steamy upset. And he had a heart attack. He didn't die. Good news for him. His neighbor, two doors down, didn't know anything about what this guy was doing. He, uh, he saw the manure. He didn't order it either. But he got out a little wheelbarrow and started spreading it around the yard. That manure didn't stink anymore. It, it, he had the best flowers in the whole neighborhood. His yard smelled sweet. The little bit of work for moving the manure got his ticker to go in. He had a healthy heart. What are you doing when the manure hits the fan in your life? Who are you dealing with and how are you dealing? These are the conditions under which life really works. All your friends and family are just waiting to, 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 to someone sock it to you, Harper Valley PTA, and you do something like Jesus would. And they go, really? Can you do that? Or do we just join all the, all the people who are grumbling? By way of application, just a couple of things. There is a test, and I'm going to give it to you, so look on your outline here. If you haven't written any notes in, I think you can still work with the test. So to really know Jesus is to become like Jesus. So here's the quiz. According to the passage this morning, you were designed for obedience. You were designed to say yes to God courageously, not no to God uh, creatively. Are you obeying or are you complaining about your lot in life most of the time? Now, you know, you might be sitting there pretty close to your neighbor, so you don't have to circle the right answer yet. You might want to just take this home. Or do it like Jay. He's out in the car doing this right now. Your behavior reflects Jesus through your imperfections. That's what we found out today. The more imperfect we are, and the more people know those in imperfections, and we're not trying to be churchianity here, or we're not trying to impress anyone, when that's the case, are you serving imperfectly, or are you waiting for perfection, and then you're going to sign up on, on Mike's clipboard to go work at the work day, or to help with the kids at the bonfire, or to, you know, whatever it is that God's asking you to do. You see, a lot of us say, oh, I'm imperfect. I'm, I'm not worthy. I'm not called for that. Oh, yes, you are. You just don't know it. I haven't arrived yet. God is using all kinds of imperfect vessels. You are blessed through your hardships. Do you know that? Are you receiving hardships or are you avoiding hardships? Just take a survey of the last four days of your life. What were you living for? That was even a stretch for me, you know. And I get paid to be a Christian, okay? Let's so get that right out there. I can, that's how bad this can get messed up, okay? You know. I, and so you just go four days back and recall, what was I living for last week? Many of us might sheepishly confess that our ultimate goal was to walk slowly and carefully to the edge of our own grave and fall in safely and go, Phew. At which point they would have put on my tombstone, what a relief, nothing bad happened. You see, we can play it so safe that God is literally meaningless to our lives and we don't need it. You see, Jesus was God's key person so that you and I could be Jesus' key person. With all the stuff that gets in the way so that we could be the people that God wants us to be. 
So what are you going to live for this week? Jesus, there's no doubt in my mind that we desire to live for you and we will be weak and, and weary and things will mess up in our lives, but we want to reveal you. We don't want to be over our heads in the things that you have for us. We don't want to be in a position where you are um, asking us to do things that we know we can't, but your scripture says that that's the way it works. And so we're praying uh, this morning that you would teach us and show us and lead us in understanding how we do that. So I just thank you this morning, God, for what you're doing and how you're moving in our hearts that you, uh, you would lead us a place of your sure hope.